this is a, a female practitioner. Uh, it's by no means all, either uh, a male provenance. Uh, this is a woman who lives at a, a mountain community called uh, Datema, which is about two hours uh, north of, of Yangon, Rangoon. And uh, in her hermitage, this is her alchemical room taken from where the forge is, but you can see some of the apparatus that she uses in the forging and uh, transformation of her own datlon. These are very various alchemical apparatuses used. Um, the, uh, the image below is of a uh, copper, of actually sorry, of an iron uh, cast uh, forge which is used to actually solidify the mercury. This is the beads you see there are actually made from solidified mercury, which is also they're considered to have uh, a very uh, powerful effects and uh, there's a whole technology involved in transforming mercury from its liquid state into one in which it can be used either as talismans or as prayer beads or as votive figures. And the figure in the center, the galon or the, uh, the garuda, is, is a kind of celestial hawk figure, mythical hawk that's involved uh, in uh, symbolically in the literally the killing of the mercury. In other words, to kill its toxic, this toxic substance so that it can be resurrected as a therapeutic substance. So this is the, an image of the galon involved in that transformation. These are again some of the uh, various ingredients used. You can see a plate on the upper right of these various uh, solidified mercuric balls that are used for healing, used in meditation, uh, used in various other forms of transformation. This is the dat datlon or essence ball itself being held by a number of different practitioners showing its current shape and form. This is something that you often will see uh, various practitioners do. They, you, you compare your, your datlon. It's to, you, uh, either kept in an amulet around the neck, it might be in the pocket, it might be in a bag, but it's always held to be in a way um, although, although it's held to be a representation, in a certain sense, a condensed condensing of your own uh, process in the world, your own psychic state, uh, it's, another, it's also freely handed around. And you, can, you can look at it and test it. And it's, so it's not considered to be something that's vulnerable to, to the bad intentions of anyone who might uh, uh, pick it up. Here's, again, another monk holding his datlon. And this is a 96-year-old um, a, uh, monk in Rangoon who, uh, whose specialty is to, uh, solidifying mercury from its liquid state. Apparently he can do it in a few minutes. And this is a, um, a mercury statue of this very important uh, early alchemist uh, in Burma, Boba Ong, which he forged supposedly from, from directly from liquid mercury. Uh, but there are other practitioners who emphasize less the datlon or the essence ball than the actual powders that are the gold ash powders that are derived from the transmuted form of mercury. This is a practitioner here who is actually also a traditional doctor who had reams and reams of papers of testimonies of the people who he claims to have healed of AIDS and cancer and various other intractable and incurable diseases. And I spent a day with him where the end result was this uh, golden ash that he was holding here uh, in this cup and something that then would be prescribed uh, to a patient and he had people all day long, uh, both monks, um, lay people of, from all walks of life coming to him claiming that they have had actually miraculous results uh, from using this ash, which was its primal substance was, was mercury. This is the abbot of the monastery in, uh, in the Mun district in southeastern um, Burma, uh, where the 15 uh, treatises that date back to the earliest one from 1257 uh, are currently kept and one of the most revered of the of the alchemist monks in in Burma today and exuded a, a, a wonderful kind of serenity and nonetheless he lives on a form of he takes his powdered mercury 
and puts it in honey and has a spoonful of that every day. That's his, his elixir uh, in that form. In terms of uh, the political dimensions that I mentioned earlier, this figure on the left, uh, Bomingong, was a very, very key figure right up until the mid-1940s during the transition from British rule in Burma. Um, and there's very much a view uh, by practicing alchemists today in Burma that this is not just a practice for one's own personal benefit, but very much something in which the, outer, the, the various transformations that happen within the laboratory, if you will, are, can have a reciprocal effect on the outer world. And so with that particular intention of trying to bring about increased freedom, increased liberation from the kinds of politically induced suffering that are in Burma today, uh, alchemists and mercury eaters in Burma do see themselves as involved in a socially activist uh, form, albeit in a, contem in a contemplative uh, packaging but they do feel that their actions uh, have this kind of larger repercussions in the world. And it's always the rituals are done, uh, timed with particular astrological events, particular phases of the moon to in have in, uh, the most efficacy as possible. Sorry, this we won't go through the concluding questions, but uh, the... Oops. I think some of the questions that does raise for me um, the persistence of a tradition that we tend to feel in the West was completely phased out by modern chemistry and really not only does it not have relevance any longer um, but in fact the hazards of mercury use are so well publicized and well known in the Western world that we tend to uh, look askance at any traditions that might uh, continue uh, to use it as a substance with a, a presumed therapeutic uh, dimension. And um, particularly in the, in the sense that we've had so many medicines that have been used uh, to ill effect in the Western world that were in fact mercury-based. Ba uh, mercury but what particularly intrigues me about this project is these stages of transformation that occur in which the toxic effects of mercury are very well recognized and nonetheless in the Indian tradition, Tibetan tradition, and Burmese tradition perhaps most actively of all um, seen as something that very very not only can it transform uh, the metal itself into a therapeutic ag uh, agent but even diseased uh, diseases that may be current in your own body are transformed also in the process. And so there, there are interesting questions that that raises about, you know, what actually is this process? Is it pure fantasy? Is there some kind of esoteric science involved with it that bears the further investigation? And if so, and if there are certain things that seem at least to bring mercury out from a highly toxic substance, it, at the very least into a neutral one, can some of that uh, technology be used to neutralize uh, the, even in Burma, the recognition that, that the environment itself has been heavily polluted through mining, uh, through the indiscriminate use of mercury and the improper use of mercury. So although uh, Burmese alchemists will claim that they're not frightened of mercury, they nonetheless recognize that in its untransmuted form it's very, very dangerous. Um, and so this is again one of their, one of their concerns. So that's, um, I think, my allotted time. So I'll, I'll open it up to questions if anyone has.